God is certainly a magnificent God. And we are appreciative for his mercy and his grace. We're thankful that God has allowed us to see a day that we've not seen before. And we're just grateful that we serve a God that does not treat us according to what we're worth. We thank God that he has uh, blessed us to hear some magnificent preaching on tonight. Uh, both of these men have did an excellent job uh, in preaching the word of God. And we're thankful for what they have deposited already. Uh, we try uh, to get the brotherhood out of the hood. Uh, we just appreciate that message and of course, uh, Brother Holly took us to the garden and, and helped us with paradise and then had a word for our wives. I just appreciate uh, what he deposited as well on tonight. Uh, both of these men are great preachers and we've had good preaching all week. Uh, these men have done some powerful preaching. Uh, we just thank God uh, for what was deposited here at the Southeastern Lectureship. Uh, and this is always a qualitative lectureship. And we just appreciate that so much. We're excited uh, that is going to be coming to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, where Brother Howard Wright will be hosting. Uh, and of course, uh, we are going to support him fully in this great effort. I sympathize with anybody that's got to uh, organize a lectureship. And so I, with that said, I thank God for uh, the host of this lectureship, all of them uh, and grateful for the invitation to be part uh, of this great endeavor. Uh, and it's always good to see brethren of like precious faith as we can share in the faith once delivered. I would like you, if you would, to turn with me to the book of Romans. And the chapter is 8. I'm going to commence that reading in verse 1 and culminate in verse 4. And prayerfully, our God will allow me to stay consistent with the ethereal intent and the exegetical idea of this passage and follow the flow of this literary structure and hopefully understand the grammatical and syntactical understanding of this text. And that just means I'm about to preach. And that's all that all that means. <laughs> How about all that means? Praise Jesus. <laughs> it just sounds good that way, that's all I mean. I do want to do that though. <laughs> I do want to be consistent with the author's intended meaning. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're reading the King James Version, you have a second clause that's debated as to whether or not it belongs in verse 1, and that is, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But if you have another translation, that clause is missing, but it is picked up in verse 4 and 5. Verse 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. <clears throat> For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. I just want to read that one more time, just in case you missed that subtle and powerful statement. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. Just like that. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, <clears throat> he condemned sin in the flesh. Purpose statement. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. I want to 
walk through the hallways of Paulian theology just for a few moments and appreciate the gospel, the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I want to suggest to you tonight that the gospel of Jesus Christ by way of proposition that I want you to embrace in your spirit for tonight is that God did for you what you could not do for yourself. I want you to embrace that salvation is in fact by grace and is in the category of that which is unmerited and unearned. Now, this is something we do not always appreciate because uh, for many of us throughout the years, um, we have placed, uh, and rightfully so, quite a bit of emphasis on the distinctive nature of the New Testament church, a message that is in fact necessary. We place that under the category of what is known as ecclesiology or the study of the church. However, I want to suggest to you that before you dive into ecclesiology, <clears throat> there is something that is chronologically more important, and it would be called Christology. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, by the use of the term Christology, I am speaking about the study of the person and work of Christ. When we speak about ecclesiology, we are talking about the study of the church. But if we're not careful, we will place more emphasis on the ecclesiology while ignoring the Christology. Now what that simply means is that we cannot put more emphasis on church and leave out Christ. Now this is not to suggest that the church is not important, but it is to say that Christ is a necessary precursor to understanding anything about the New Testament church. For without Jesus, there is no church. And I would have you to understand that Jesus gives us this chronological, this chronology in, in Matthew the 16th chapter, we quote it all the time. But the problem is, we place more emphasis on verse 18 while ignoring the context of the conversation. So more, many of us place a lot of emphasis on in the Lord Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. That's an important passage. But the context starts with a different question. And Paul, or rather Matthew says, when Jesus came, to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, Christology, that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say thou art John the Baptist. Some say Jeremiah or maybe one of the prophets. But Jesus said, whom do you say that I am, Christology? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of then he says to Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Christology, I will build my church ecclesiology. Now what I want to show you here is that the church is built on the Christ, in which if we're not careful, we will place more emphasis on the church and miss the rock. Now, uh, unless you get uncomfortable, this is not to suggest the church is not important, but it is to say we need to appreciate the finished work of Christ and what he accomplished on our behalf, lest we miss that salvation is unearned and it is unmerited. Now, I want to be very careful to, uh, and I don't really need you to shout, I need you to listen, uh, 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 just so you know, 
uh, because what I'm about to say, um, I want to be sure that you get it and that you don't miss it so that you don't walk out thinking I said one thing that I didn't say. So I need you to listen to it. I want you to understand that we are saved by Christ and we become the church. Yes. In other words, the church is the product of obedience to the gospel. Which means when a person obeys the right gospel, they become a member of the one body. Are you following this? But what makes us the one body is what we call the gospel. Now, if you're not careful, you can preach a whole sermon on the one church and not preach gospel. Okay. Because if you go through talking about all of the necessary things, you took the Lord's Supper on the first day, uh, Jesus is the head of the church, uh, Jesus is the foundation of the church, uh, there's five acts of worship, they gave on the first day, they sang with that instrument of music, now come to Jesus. <laughs> if you don't tell folks what Christ accomplished on Calvary's cross, you have not yet preached the gospel. <laughs> I'm going to say it again because I ain't scared of it. I really not. I've never been. But you don't need to be nervous. What I need you to do is hear me. And what I want you to understand is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have not preached the gospel. If you have not preached what Christ accomplished at the cross, confirmed by his resurrection. If you haven't preached that, then you preached us. The church is the people of God. Say it one more time. God 
treated Christ as if he sinned, so he could treat you as if you never sinned. Are you following that? Now, church, that will only make a man shout if he first know he is sinned. Now, if you think somehow you earned this, and somehow you think you're good enough, then that ain't going to do nothing for you. But I'm tired of church folks shouting over cars and houses and what God did on their job. Now the 
Jews were ignorant of that, according to Romans chapter 10. My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For they have a zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge. For they've gone about to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. What the Jews did not understand was how God put a man in right standing with himself. So Paul is going to argue throughout the entire letter that righteousness does not come by the law, but it comes from the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Are you following that so far? Now, now let me do this very quickly. Look at Romans 8. Look at Romans 8. We won't have time to do all of that. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8 starts with the phrase, therefore. That means it's going to be virtually an impossible uh, feat. For me to explain chapter 8, and you don't know what's going on in chapter 7. That means in chapter 7, you need to see the ugly picture of this. Paul's going to paint the picture of Romans 7. Of himself trying to attain righteousness by law. Listen to me carefully. Law. Codified law. When God puts you under a legal system, when God leads you under a legal system, you will find yourself coming short of God's standard because law can only expose sin, but it can't fix it. I said law, codified law, legal law can only condemn because it exposes man's sinfulness. Now man and his problem, Paul calls it flesh. Now, uh, let's, I won't have time to go to all chapter 7, but Paul uses various definitions for flesh. When Paul says flesh, he doesn't always mean your human body. Sometimes Paul uses flesh to describe the weakness of your human nature that is infected by sinful passions. I am on that. Now, whether you know it or not, every last one of y'all got a flesh problem. Every last one of now, your flesh problem doesn't always play out the same way mine does. But everybody has a flesh problem. A human weakness infected by sinful passions. Unless you judge me for what I'm doing, you have the same flesh problem. It just plays out different. Now, ain't no sense of you pointing out someone else's fornication and you're a habitual liar. Ain't no sense trying to point out somebody's adultery, but you are a habitual liar. You want to talk about the adultery, but not your homosexuality. We have a habit of pointing out everybody else's sin problem as if we don't understand everybody has a flesh problem. Look at Romans 7, quickly. Look at Romans 7. Look at Romans 7. Don't have time to move it on, but I need you to look at verse number 5. 5 is where you get a definition of flesh. King James is going to describe flesh as the motions of sin. New American Standard is going to refer to it as the passions, sinful passions. Everybody got it. Here's the reality. You can't fully Manage your flesh problem. You might do good two days, and on day three, y'all not gonna help me long here. That flesh problem starts arousing, and the problem is when you have a thou shalt not law. The thou shalt not law exposes sin but it doesn't fix or address your flesh problem. Now, saints, I'm trying to help you see something. I'm trying to help you see that salvation is by grace. And sometimes we won't admit salvation is by grace because the word is abused by denominations. But I'm trying to tell you grace belongs to us. And when I say that, I'm simply meaning we should understand that salvation is by grace and it's not something we merit. Now, church, that ain't just theology for me. That's real for me. And I had to learn how to start preaching grace and stop pretending like I didn't need it. I said I had to start preaching grace because I didn't want to pretend anymore as if I didn't need it. Once you are acquainted with the reality of your flesh problem, stop looking at me trying to figure out what it is. But I want you to be acquainted with the fact that Christ fixed it when you have an answer 
to your fresh problem that you couldn't get. Watch this. Let I got an eye, boy. I know what you're feeling, dude. Romans 7 says, when I would do good, evil is with his enemy. Paul is now painting the picture of him trying to attain the righteousness of the law while being pulled by another law that he said dwells in his members. Now this law that dwells in his members, he calls it the law of sin and death. Now that's not a codified law because that law is the rule and dominance of sin in the life of the person trying to attain righteousness. The law of sin and death rules. Any man's like Paul said, when I'm trying to do good, evil's present. Why is it present, Paul? Because I got another law. Dwelling in my members. And every time I try to reach for the righteousness of God, I find that I'm struggling with another law that's dominating my existence. So I find myself doing what I hate, although I want to do what I love, and I got a hate-love relationship going on in as much as I'm dominated by this law of sin and death. Check this out. And when Paul says that, he says, We know it's right. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying. But everybody knows about that tug of war. Yeah. Yeah. Where if God left me to my own moral merit, I keep coming up short from the righteousness I'm trying to get. And Paul says, There's none righteous. No, not one. But at time I saw you that Paul Jesus had a way of killing folk with the law they thought they obeyed. Just don't have time. There's something to tell you that every time I went through good, evil's present. Then he says, oh, wretched. Who shall? Man, y'all acting like y'all don't know what sin is. <laughs> oh, oh, God. I, who shall deliver me from this body? Man, there is an interesting picture that men have painted, the Kairishis have painted, are uh, using for the word wretched. And it's the idea that a man when he committed murder sometimes had a dead man strapped to his back. He would go throughout the city saying, who shall deliver me uh, from this body of death? Although everybody walks in church upright, every one of us know what it is to work home or walk humped over with a dead body strapped to your back that you're wondering who will deliver me. That's why the church is one of the funniest places in the world because we have a habit of coming to church and acting like we have no need for grace. And I wonder why folk can't shout. I know why you can't shout. You're too busy trying to self-righteous yourself to heaven rather than understand you need the grace of God. When you realize the depth of your sin problem, it'll change how you worship, it'll change how you serve God, it'll change how you do ministry because you are grateful that God saved you, not based on your merit, but based on his grace. Watch the text. Paul then says, I thank Christ Jesus. Who delivered me? That's Romans 7. Watch chapter 8. Once you understand chapter 7, chapter 8 slides, now therefore, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ. The word condemnation is the Greek word katapima, and the word indicates uh, one's guilt and headed for punishment. Listen, Jesus, when you get in Christ, God didn't take away your capacity to sin. He lifted the penalty of your sin. You don't know when to sin. When you unify with Christ, in Christ, because of his blood and the efficacy of his death, when a man gets in Christ, your capacity to sin is still present. But because of what Christ did at the cross, when you get in Christ, God lifted the penalty.
when you sin, when you sin yesterday, blood was good for you. When you sin today, blood's good for you. And the blood is good for sin you ain't done yet. So we, we don't know what gospel is and how good the news is. Uh, praise Jesus. I need you to understand the blood is that good. Now, that means that Christ's death satisfied the justice of God. I got to hurry up. I know. Don't, don't you give me nothing. Don't give me nothing. Now look at Romans 8, verse 2. It's hard to do in 30 minutes. Give, give me verse 2. All right, watch this. Watch this. For what the law could not do. Well, verse 3. I got to uh, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is the dominance of the Holy Spirit is what in, in Christ Jesus is what set me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, God uh, has placed me on the, do the dominant law of the Holy Spirit and has freed me from the dominance of sin and death. Now, watch this. In verse number three, it says, for what the law could not do. That's Moses' law. Moses' law was not the law of sin and death. Moses' law couldn't fix the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is what dwells in your members. And the law of Moses could not address your flesh problem. So he says, what the law could not do. What could the law not do? The law could not address your flesh problem. Which is why you are not righteous on your own merit. What the law could not do, God did. See, I'm missing that. What the law could do, God did. Oh my God. Uh, 
let me give you two illustrations that I've done. I did this one before in several places, but it makes the point so well. Uh, it makes the point so well. And, and I want you to understand there was a woman who went to court and had three tickets. And she had three tickets in court. The woman uh, knew that she was in trouble. Judge said, I I'm going to have to send you to jail behind this one. A uh, woman said, listen, Judge, I can't pay that price. That, that, that I, I can't, I just need you to give me some mercy. Judge said, according to the law, I can't give you no mercy. And woman said, listen, I know I'm guilty, but if you can just do something, I know I'm guilty, but if you can do something, get me out of trouble with the law. He said, ma'am, according to this law, you got to go to jail. Well, uh, the woman dropped her head and started crying. So the judge felt compassion and had to figure out a way to make, uh, to make justice get satisfied but at the same time give mercy. The judge wanted to give him mercy, but he can't give him mercy unless justice is satisfied. Because if he satisfies justice alone, the woman can't get no mercy. But if he gives her mercy without justifying the law, then he's not a righteous judge. So he's gonna find a way to make justice get satisfied while at the same time giving some mercy. So the woman dropped her head, but then the judge felt compassion and figured out something. So he stood up from behind his desk took his robe and laid it to the side, went down to the woman's level, went down in his own pocket, got the price for the ticket out of his own pocket, put the price next to the woman. When he put the price next to the woman, he went on back up to his judge seat, took his robe, put it back on, because his robe is his glory. He put his glory back on and said, woman, look up at me. Somebody, while he wasn't looking, paid a price that you couldn't pay.
Thank you. 